Hello everyone. So today I am talking to you about ecosystem function in marine environments, specifically in Hong Kong's impacted coastal ecosystems. So let's first define the meaning of ecosystem function. Most people are more aware of the term ecosystem services, um, and it usually involves things that directly benefit human lives, like the provision of food or clean water. But for ecosystem function, we are talking about these pairs of complementary ecological processes that include bioerosion, calcification, primary production in the form of macroalgal growth, the transfer of energy and nutrient between trophic levels in the form of herbivory and predation, nutrient release, and as well as nutrient reintegration back to the environment. These functions are mainly governed by two drivers. The first driver is environmental. For example, water quality or sediment quality. And the second driver is intrinsic, which is the biodiversity. So generally speaking, you would expect ecosystem function to be high in places where water quality and biodiversity are high. But in places like Hong Kong, where urban population is 100%, we have experienced a lot of ecological and uh, environmental catastrophe um, in the recent years. Um, most famously, I think, is the reclamation by Hong Kong International Airport and uh, Victoria Harbor in the city center. Just as important is the collapse of the fishing industry in the 1970s because the improvement in fishing vessel technology outpaced government regulation. So in this period, we experienced a lot of loss of fishing, uh, of fish species. So these are just two of many examples of things that have shifted the balance between ecosystem function and the two main governing drivers. So our research team is mainly focused on these seven sites across Hong Kong that span about 60 kilometers from the Northeast to the Southwest of Hong Kong. These sites display a wide range of physical characteristics and water quality. The difference of water quality comes from two different sources of water. The first source is from Pearl River Delta in China, and it brings about estuarine water that is high in turbidity, high in nitrogen, and low in salinity. The second source of water is from South China Sea, um, that is relatively pristine and oceanic. So these two contrasting sources of water creates a natural water quality gradient. And the anthropogenic drivers that I've mentioned previously exacerbates this water quality gradient that occurs naturally. So we can generally divide our sites into three separate groups into estuarine, transitional, and oceanic sites. Um, we divided them based on the eight water quality parameters that we collected from Hong Kong's Environmental Protection Department. In this principal component analysis, you can see that the estuarine sites group mainly in the right side of the PCA and were correlated with um, parameters like nitrogen concentration, chlorophyll, fecal coliform, and turbidity, while our transitional sites group in the center and our oceanic sites group in the left side of the PCA and were correlated with salinity. So with this in mind, we then assess both biodiversity and ecosystem function using all standardized methods that have been previously tested um, in other studies. Because of the time limit, I am only going to share with you four ecosystem functions that we conducted. So 
So to measure algae and benthic coverage, we use this tool called the Autonomous Reef Monitoring Structures, or the ARMS. These are layers of PVC plates that we installed on the seafloor about four meters deep and 50 meters from the coastline for about one year. After one year, um, we collected back these arms, disassembled them and took pictures of each plate. This is an example of an arms plate. You can see the settlement of various kinds of organisms from calcified worm tubes, sponges, bryozoans, and red algae. These photos were then uploaded to an online software called CoralNet, where we could do a semi-automated annotation in two different groups. So this is the result of the um, arms plates. This is, these are two examples of the arms plates that we collected from San Sequan in the estuarine group and Dongpeng Zhao in the oceanic group. So these two are um, completely contrasting um, plates from complete opposite of the map. In San Sequan, not all of, not all of the plates were covered by um, bentos, and most of the settled areas were um, settled by bivalves. While in Dongping Chao, it was mostly more densely packed by various kinds of organisms from sponges to tunicates and bryozoans. On the right side of the slide, you can see four different kinds of organisms that perform very well as water quality indicators. So macroalgae and bryozoa were positively correlated with increasing water quality, except for this bryozoan cover in San Sequan. Um, I'm pretty sure they are distinct species compared to the six other sites. Um, contrastingly, the bivalves and worm tubes were the opposite. Um, they were more positively correlated with increasing nitrogen concentration in the sites, but the worm tubes did not flourish in low salinity estuarine sites. To measure fish and sea urchin abundances, we, con we conducted basic um, belt transect surveys and in the proximity of the arms. First, um, we swim toward one direction and recorded fast moving fish. And then we swim back to record cryptic fishes hiding between crevices and sea urchins. We also saw a similar trend with the oceanic sites where they grouped together and were correlated with salinity while the other sites in the estuarine and transitional groups were, most, were mostly um, dispersed and were correlated with chlorophyll, fecal coliform, nitrogen concentration, and so on. To measure herbivory, we deployed these sets of algae tied onto nylon ropes. In each set, one rope is left open and one rope is caged to prevent animals to graze on it. And we infer herbivory rate from the difference of mass loss um, between the open rope and the cage rope after 24 hours of deployment. To measure predation rate, we use this tool called the squid pups. Essentially, they are dried squid tethered onto bamboo rods. And just like the herbivory essay, we inserted these um, squid pops onto the seafloor and then waited for 24 hours. And we infer a predation rate by the percentage of baits consumed over the baits that we recovered. So we expected herbivory to also increase along the water quality gradient. But instead, we saw this interesting sharp peak in the um, in Central Island, which is a transitional site, and the rest of the sites 
um, mostly perform about 50% or, or less. So it turns out herbivory was not at all associated with fish abundance, um, but it was strongly associated with sea urchin abundance on a linear model. Here you can see in Central Island, it was dominated by this monoculture of sea urchin called Salmasis spheroides. And one way to explain this phenomenon is that because of habitat destruction and overfishing, we lost sea urchin predator. And this allows the sea urchin to flourish and multiply uncontrollably. The loss of sea, um, herbivores like a parrotfish also allows the sea urchins to um, take over the ecological function as the main grazers of these sites. For predation rate, just like herbivory, we also did not see a clear pattern following water quality gradients. Instead, we see this um, really high variation in several of our sites, meaning that in different um, assays, we, um, we saw both minimum and maximum values. So sometimes the baits were fully eaten and sometimes the bait were not touched at all by the fish. For secondary production that we inferred from fish richness and fish biomass, there is a clear trend uh, following water quality gradient, especially in the summer. Here you see in the Ashran sites, Pengchao and Central Island, um, they were mostly dominated by middle and low trophic level fish and almost little to, um, little to almost no predator at all. So this allows them to pretty much roam freely and eat um, as much squid pops as they wanted. But in more pristine sites, they don't have this kind of luxury because we do see a lot more um, high trophic level fish, meaning the top predators. But this, but we also assume, we initially assumed that the predators would consume squid pops, but that was not necessarily the case because in these oceanic sites, the predation rate was um, quote unquote diluted by the um, by the presence of other prey fish. So essentially the squid pops are competing for the um, attention of the predators with the other prey fish. So to sum up, ecosystem function in impacted coastal ecosystems were not at all consistent with water quality and biodiversity patterns. We suspect that this happens because of um, anthropogenic drivers like habitat degradation and fragmentation and overfishing that causes loss of species. This has shifted the balance between trophic levels, um, but this does not necessarily mean it's a bad thing all the time because um, looking at the example from our herbivory essays, if the sea urchins did not take over the role as the main grazers in the impacted sites, we might see a lot of algal, al, macroalgal growth that possibly would cover up the corals um, settling on those sites. And atrophication might happen um, in those sites as well. And then these things would be proven to be catastrophic for those sites. So it is interesting to see how these um, estuarine sites to be very resilient. And even though there's low biodiversity and low water quality, they were still able to function and like um, to fulfill their ecological function. And the second conclusion is that the study of ecosystem health requires all three components of assessment that I have mentioned today, from assessment of water quality, biodiversity, and ecosystem function. 
missing one or two of them um, might cause some misinterpretation of data or the actual conditions of the ecosystems. So with that, I conclude and would love to take any question from the audience. Thank you very much for listening.